We're going to get started with the partnering with the agricultural industry panel. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully this morning already Adam and Frank and Mark have provided the inspiration that there's a huge need for technology innovation and new venture creation in the ag industry. As we move on to the panel sessions, we're going to start talking about how, as an entrepreneur, you can begin putting that inspiration into activity. Uh, with these panels, we want them to be interactive. We don't want to just be up here talking at you. So as you have questions, you know, please, the, there's two microphones. We'd appreciate it if you come to a microphone so everyone can hear your question. But please ask questions. Uh, at any time, at least during this panel. Uh, the ag industry uh, is a great place for new entrepreneurs to partner, whether that is as you're starting a company or have an idea about starting a company and need to think about idea val validation, whether it is looking for a development partner or a customer, potentially an investor, or at the end of the day, uh, potentially an acquisition, and lots of interesting things in between. So the purpose of this panel is to get the perspectives of a diverse group of people that within their organizations are responsible for partnering with people like you. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the, the panel. I should start with myself. I am Roger Van Hoy. I am Director of Corporate Relations here at the University of Illinois. And every day I work with companies like those on the, the podium here to interact and partner with the university. Next up, we've got Mark Finchman. Would you like to introduce yourself and your company? Yep, thanks. Uh, Mark Fincham with John Deere. Uh, I'm in the business development group of our precision ag division. So that, that precision ag division at Deere is called the Intelligent Solutions Group. And so I work on uh, things like partnering with external companies, M&A activity. Uh, and then I also manage uh, the, the startup collaborator that I know was mentioned earlier in the, in the session. All right, next up we have Tim Kilhorn. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Kilhorn. I'm the head of technology for the Nutrient Ag Solutions Champaign campus. Uh, prior to that, I was CTO and co-founder of Agrable. So uh, the Champaign campus was the product of the acquisition of Agrable by, uh, by Nutrient. And uh, so I've been involved in working with larger companies as a startup and now sort of on the other side of things, working on uh, bringing digital tools to retail and seeing what possible collaborations are out there. And next we have Kirsten Skogerson. I'm part of the Open Innovations and Strategic Partnerships Organization at Bear Crop Science. And I work really closely with the insect control and weed control discovery and portfolio teams to identify, evaluate, and then manage external partnerships. Um, at the front end of this process, I'm working to translate the needs and gaps of my teams to the competitive intelligence or business intelligence and uh, prospecting teams. Then once a partner's identified, I'm helping with the negotiation, ne negotiations. And then finally, of course, managing the relationship. So some of the key responsibilities there include building and maintaining that relationship, evaluating the science and process and progress of the relationship and making recommendations for the technology and the partner as we move forward. Of course, also the larger, broader responsibilities of developing best-in-class um, processes and approaches to make Bayer uh, the partner of choice in ag innovation space, and to also make sure that we're maximizing the value, not only to us, but to our partner companies as well. And then for those of you who are students here and maybe thinking about career path, I'm an analytical chemist. I would have never guessed I'd be sitting here on this type of panel. 
but I spent my time first as an individual contributor and then leading teams that were working in the discovery space. So always working to either develop or identify new technologies and then look at um, deploying them. So in this current role that I have, I'm able to leverage that technical background with the network I have from working across multiple organizations in, within um, Monsanto and now Bayer to really help drive some of the um, changes in our in business strategy and in looking at new areas. So it's really exciting. And last but not least, we have Scott Wilcom. So I uh, don't really have a company. I work for the University of Illinois. Uh, but where I get to work is in CSA, which is National Center for Supercomputing Applications, and I am also the executive director of the newly minted Center for Digital Agriculture, which is really a fantastic, as uh, Laura uh, actually brought up, it is great because we get to actually get engineering and ACES together through NCSA to really share um, the great learnings on both sides. So you have all this great domain work being done at ACES. How do we actually get it productized? How do we get things applied? So we're actually working on that, those big AI problems and uh, big fluid dynamic problems or whatever else you, you want to think about. So um, the other thing I want to bring up is I get to I get to work with a lot of the companies that are in the room, but I want to make sure that I make a shout out for Brendan. I think he's in the room somewhere. I can't see you, but I saw your hand move because there's a lot of light in my eyes. But if Brendan, so Brendan actually runs our industry program. Um, the industry program at NCSA has been around, I believe, somewhere around 30 years now. The industry program is there for, there to help companies really take their domain expertise and match it to uh, some of the people we have to help accelerate the way you do your work. Um, we have helped John Deere. Uh, I was just, we were just talking earlier about an opportunity we worked with John Deere on. Uh, basically took 50,000 lines of code, turned it into 100 lines of code, and saved a ton of time on compute when we did that, it actually changed the paradigm in which they were able to do their day-to-day -day work. So those are the things we're excited about doing at NCSA. And if we can help you, especially as a startup, um, please, please uh, reach out to Brendan and I, and we can uh, get you on the right path. So uh, we're here and uh, always, always excited to help. So thank you. So the one thing that all these wonderful panelists have in common is that they serve as a point person for innovation across their organization. A variety of different companies, different uh, product offerings, so a lot of different perspectives. Uh, one thing that I think we'll see is that no matter what the industry is, there may be some differences around the edges, but a lot of the same things will cut across all of them. Um, given that we've got a variety of different stages of everything from an idea, thinking about a company, to uh, established startups that have gotten funding. For each of your organizations, you know, at what stage do you begin to get involved with thinking about partnering with outside organizations? That can really vary um, depending on the specific area and the strategic fit for the, for the idea or the company. Um, I think some examples of really early partnerships include things like companies developing new equipment or instrumentation, um, providing us a beta testing unit and getting our feedback on the quality of the data and how we're using or interacting with that equipment um, to other examples where we've had access, we have access to large sample sets or data sets. And so companies that are in very early stages developing new tools can get access to some of the data and samples that they might not otherwise get access to. That's from the early end, of course. We are involved in, in all 
different stages of, of a um, partner's life cycle. So for the Center for Digital Ag, uh, the idea there is we want to be at the S1. We want to be at the beginning. Uh, we're driving faculty together to think about new ideas and new approaches. Uh, for NCSA, my goodness, it's everybody from you know the largest of large companies to the smallest. We want to be involved in any way we can do, any way we can to help uh, change the paradigm in which you do your work. Yeah, I would say from Deere's perspective, historically we've probably focused a lot more on a, on a later stage type of a company through an acquisition or a, or a deeper partnership. We're, we're putting a lot more focus now on that earlier and mid-stage company through some of the work we're doing with, the, with various universities and through the startup program we're building that, that can really provide uh, ways for a startup to interact with Deere at, an, at a much earlier stage probably than what we historically have done. Yeah, and I'd say we're, we're taking a very similar trajectory. Uh, the Nutrient Digital Org that we're, uh, that we're a part of here in Champaign is, is very focused on immediate delivery uh, in an agile way of, of customer value. And so we're really looking for things that we can quickly turn around and, and, hand, and put in the hands of our customers. But I imagine as that platform evolves and matures, then uh, we'll be more excited about the early stage and the, the sort of building up the R&D the pipeline for what's next. And Tim, you, you answered as Nutrien, but as our recent uh, startup acquired by Nutrien, uh, how did Agrable start engaging with companies? Sure. Uh, we, we definitely uh, had a, there were a spectrum of different types of engagements we, we pursued. Uh, sort of the, on the earlier end, it, it often took more of a form of, of the joint development agreement. But, uh, but as, a, as, a, as a startup and as, a, as kind of a growth company, we, we always wanted to try to develop our, our platform as the, as the core of our value. And so being able to present that as, as much of an off-the-shelf product that could, be, could, be, could solve their pro the, the corporation's problem, uh, as much as we could present it that way as possible, was really our, what we considered our, our differentiating strength. And so that was where we tried to always position that, that conversation. Kirsten, it looked like you had a follow-up comment. No, I was actually, um, I mean, I guess follow-up to the last question was really um, around the um, sort of the changing uh, model of thinking about partnerships and whether you're getting, investing either later or earlier. I think Mark spoke to that well when he said, you know, we're not going to invent everything internally. So there are times when we do just want to go out there and find something that's ready to go and incorporate it. And I think that, um, you know, over the years, just we used to only exclusively work with external parties on development projects. And now we really understand that, that we're not going to develop everything in-house. As Laura mentioned, we've got 19 of the i teams in the audience today. A uh, big part of that is customer discovery and reaching out to potential customers like your companies. If we could just go down the line, is each of you willing to, whether it's a conversation during a break today or a phone call later, take a customer discovery call from them? Yeah, I'd absolutely uh, love to talk to people about kind of what they're doing and, and what, what new ideas they can bring to the ag industry. Definitely, we're always looking for uh, new ideas, new talent, and I think having those conversations is important because interacting with somebody with a different perspective may lead to a new idea or an expansion of the scope of, of your solution. So as NCSA, we're, we're here to support the i teams. Uh, so please come by. I'm also a farmer, so I uh, have a 2,400-acre farm over here by Monticello. So if you have ag-related issues and you'd like to talk to them, I'm always available to talk about those too. So please come by. Yep. I would echo what, what they said as well. We'd, we'd love to talk with you about ideas that you have um, and how that, how that could plug into deer. So I'd encourage the teams, take them at their word. You've got four customer discovery conversations in a row up here. Um, as they begin to have those conversations, how do you guys prefer companies to approach you with information? Are you looking for a 
PhD thesis on which the company is built, a pitch deck, a one-page overview? What, what works best for you? So we definitely have people uh, in, in the Champagne campus that would, would read that PhD thesis, uh, but, uh, but, but I don't think that's, that's necessarily the, the fastest way to get, get going on something. Uh, I do think as much context and, and background around the, the startup and, and sort of why it was founded and where, 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 where you want to be going with it is, is important to, uh, to, to build the context around the decision making process. So I, I like to see that stuff. But, uh, but then I like to get into the weeds on the, on the technology of it and really get a sense for how well architected and how, how well thought through the solution is. Um, so I get approached by a lot of different or about a lot of different opportunities. And so I think one of the key things for me is, is making sure that the information is provided very clearly and concisely. And I think getting that background, assume that your audience may not know your technology and explain the technology such that the, your customer can understand quickly and then begin talking to their other stakeholders who will ultimately be involved in making that decision. Um, things that I'd want to know about are the scope of the solution, the maturity of the idea. Is it, you know, have you validated? What's the what's the size of your validation set? Um, what the costs are going to be? What the value is? Things like that. And upfront, starting to do as much of that without any CDA in place. Lawyers. Right. Okay. So, um, for us at the Center for Digital Ag, we we have a pro program. Part of our funding is for seed seeding new opportunities. Uh, so, what we would do in the event where an ICOR opportunity came up, or you guys were actually thinking about, hey, I've got a brand new idea, we might actually try to match you up with a faculty. To, I mean, these are at the very beginning. Try to match you up with faculty, and then write up a proposal that could get you get you some funding that could create something with that faculty that then drives some new intellectual property. So we're, we're starting at the bottom. Uh, we want to help you actually get to the point where you have a great, a great proposal to the company. So please come to us and we can help you there too. I, I would echo what, what they said as well. Um, Bringing initially a, a you know a, a small deck or a one pager about what you're what you're doing so that we can try to figure out where it might fit within Deer is really helpful. The other thing I would say is uh, just to kind of set expectations, especially as a startup, that uh, you, you're probably not going to get an answer the first time you talk with us. It takes some time to uh, to figure out where that might fit. Talk with other technical experts around the company to see what that fit might be, and so that it takes several conversations to get that going. So you brought up a great point of not expecting, you know, that much from a first meeting. Can you describe a little bit more sort of how a standard engagement with a company, startup company, begins to evolve for you? Yeah. So generally, I, I get a lot of companies coming in with with different ideas that want to speak with somebody at Deer. And usually, they're they're just trying to find, you know, any person at Deer that they know to try to pitch this idea to. And so. I try to serve as that point of contact that they can interact with. Um, the, the nice thing about Deer is that I've had several roles around the company, so I have a pretty good idea of where that might plug in around Deer. And so uh, that's sort of the initial entry point, is to talk with, with me and say, hey, here's the idea. Does this fit or doesn't? And then we try to figure out if there is a fit, what does that relationship look like? Are they a candidate for our startup program? Um, do, do they just need some, you know, just some initial information about something that I can plug them in sort of informally with somebody around Deer? Um, is, it, is it something that, you know, is, is core enough to Deer that we need to look at some type of a deeper relationship? That, that's sort of the, the path that things go down as we, as we evaluate them. So I'll give you some examples from, so before my uh, work here at U of I, I was uh, vice president at Alcatel uh, doing m and I would expect 
at least 10 meetings before you feel like you actually have an opportunity. So getting rejection it should be your friend when you're, when you're uh, throwing these ideas out because they have, to, they have to actually earn traction. So it's not, a, it's not simple uh, and it's hard to take sometimes, but if you just keep at it and keep pushing, I think that's the, that's the, right, that's the right path. So that's the best advice I can give on that. Kirsten, you, you talked about not to expect a confidentiality agreement on the first meeting. What advice do you have, one, on how to deal with the fact that most companies are not going to have an initial conversation under confidentiality terms, and when is it appropriate to begin thinking about having a CDA in place, given that so many of these companies, so much is wrapped up in their technology? Sure. You know, we're not expecting you to talk about confidential information. We really uh, try to have that first meeting without the confidentiality agreement in place, because at that point, we really have no idea where this partnership is going or what our level of interest is. I think it's pretty easy to very quickly establish whether the ideas you're presenting are going to um, have a strategic fit with the company, or potentially there, there'll be something new we haven't thought about, and, and we'll take the information we have and maybe get some ideas and buy in about, about a completely unanticipated opportunity. Um, but I think, you know, so I think some of the things I mentioned before, just understanding a little bit about the maturity of the idea, um, understanding whether the equipment or the model is validated, um, understanding how broad the applicability would be. Is this a row crop play? Is this a corn only play? Is this all crops, all regions of the world? Um, we can get pretty far into understanding whether there's grounds for having that deeper technical discussion. Now, a lot of people will have presented their ideas or technology at conferences publicly. And so if you have um, publications or you have decks from those types of um, settings, you can bring those. That's, that's a good way to get started. Or even if you are just saying, you know, I'm, I'm working on a technology that is similar to X, you know, with modifications that gets around this, you know, IP FTO um, hurdle or, you know, just give a hint as to what that, where you differentiate yourself and what your unique um, offering is. Yeah, and, I, and I'd say as a startup, you already are talking with so many different stakeholders and potential stakeholders that, that require different levels of information disclosure. There's sort of your board of directors, your, your active investors, your potential investors, and then the public, of course. And so I think just having a very clear internal conversation about what, where those lines are and what your message is to these different audiences, I think goes a long way to saying, all right, when I'm sitting down in a meeting, I know there, there's not an NDA yet. How should I have this conversation? How should I engage this, this potential stakeholder and get them excited about what we're doing? One thing I would just add is, you know, if you're a startup and you, you, know, you get an audience, you know, you're talking with a, with a big company, and, and, which is a big opportunity, uh, don't, don't feel bad in, in relation to this. If, if, if I ask something of you that you're not willing to share under a DA, don't feel like you have to. You know, just, it, it doesn't, uh, you're not going to offend me if you say, hey, I, I just can't share that without an NDA in place. Um, feel free to say that. That's fine. So we've addressed it a little bit in some of your comments, but I want to address it explicitly. What is it that your company is looking for as it evaluates a, an, an opportunity, whether that's the management team, the, the technology, the market fit? You know, what are those things that really get you excited about an opportunity? Yeah, so in, in addition to kind of what I said about how we want to add, add value and capability to our, our digital platform, uh, really, and, and kind of to echo some of those, those statements about early meetings, I think uh, uh, identifying a culture fit is really important. Identifying a, a very similar uh, sort of development mindset and, and sort of process 
and then having the right timing. And, and what I mean by timing is that as a startup, I know that you're in a very different place kind of from a revenue perspective and from a, uh, you, you always want to get things done right away and, and that's absolutely where I've been for my, my, for my entire life as a, as, as a startup co-founder. Uh, but not, not every corporation is able to move at that speed and, and very often there are, there are more challenges, more roadblocks and, and, and delays. And so making sure that there's enough stabi operational stability that we can get through those things is going to be very important. I think in addition to that, we're always looking for the win-win situation because if we're partnering with people who are getting as much value out of that partnership as we are, then we know that it's going to be a relationship that will deliver and really maximize the impact of the work together. So I think that's another thing that's important to us. Uh, the relationship's very important to having a team, uh, working with teams where we build that trust and openness are also, is also um, something that we're always looking for. So when it comes to agriculture, I'm going to put my other hat on now, farmer. Um, the thing that I think the most important piece is, is, you know, Mark brought it up. He actually said, I am only thinking about yield, right? Well, in reality, what he's truly thinking about is dollar per acre or even dollar per square foot. So when you come up with your idea, and you're thinking about your idea, think about that end customer, understand the market, and understand that there's a finite amount of money being spent by that farmer to be able to actually afford that work. So it's a, uh, I mean, it's tough, right? Because you've got, you got Bear sitting there wanting to sell you seed, you've got, and, and it's expensive. You have uh, John Deere selling me half million dollar combines. Those are, those are expensive, and we only have a finite amount of money and with the prices of market and understanding your market and understanding where you're going, that dollar per acre, think about that. Because in the end, siloing out, oh, my technology is the, the best, right? But you silo and you think, hey, it, it'll never, it'll never, nobody will never, they got to take it. That's not true. It really comes down to dollar per acre. So as you're thinking about these problems, think about dollar per acre. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I, I would echo that and echo what Kirsten said as well about you, you want it to be a win win with with uh, the company that we're that we're potentially looking looking at. When I when I think about areas, you know what what is Deer interested in? I usually try to characterize it as you know you saw the equipment and the stuff that Mark Moran talked about earlier. Um, to help me understand how how you can make that equipment smarter, more precise. Uh, more accurate than it is right now. Those are those are capabilities and technologies that I'm very interested in. Um, and if you can show me that, um, that's that's something that the deer has a has a huge interest in right now. And to that point, um, we know that as a farmer because one of the things that you're you're really trying to press right now is how do we keep um, basically farmers safe? But you're also you're at, the equipment's getting so wide, and you're and you're actually that to Mark's point earlier, he said, you only got one head and, and, and two eyes, and you're actually sitting there watching a 40 foot head in front of you to help us actually do a better job and run across that field. That That's actually lowering yeah. our dollar per acre. Yep. So that's right, that's right. And that just brings to mind a sustainability. So, you know, we're always looking for new technologies that help the farmer use resources um, smarter. So Scott brought up a good point. Ag is a very cyclical market. Right now, commodity prices are down. Uh, several years ago, they were up. Uh, is there any advice you can give to the startup companies in the room on how to approach your organization in an up market versus a down market, or a down market versus an up market? So a, a couple of different things. Uh, you know, Deer is looking at uh, the technology roadmaps that we need to develop, you know, somewhat irregardless of cycle, we, we know that we have to develop that. So that, that's a good thing in the sense that uh, we, we could sort of work through those downturns better, better than uh, maybe a smaller company or, or growers because there's, um, there's that time to get through that down cycle. So that helps and in in, in means that we're continuously looking for that technology, re excuse me, regardless of what cycle we're in. Um, 
the, the downside is as growers, you know, as you mentioned, in that down cycle, they're much less willing to commit dollars to a uh, an innovative technology or an unproven technology than they when in the down cycle. And so it, it's harder for for as a startup for you to find growers that are willing to pay for that in the down cycle than it is when corn's at you know six dollars an acre and then they can go ahead and try new things. Anything that gets them an extra you know bushel an acre is is useful at that point. So. Um, it, it's sort of, those are probably the two sides of that that I would say. But it comes down to, it still comes down to dollar per acre. Yeah. So if they can lower that dollar per acre, it's a win. Right, that's right. And, and so how clearly can you articulate that to the grower or, or deer or anybody else is, is crucial. You know, the down cycles put some pressure on, on us and so um, but overall, I would agree that there isn't a huge change in um, how we're interacting with external partners. We might have fewer dollars, but at the end of the day, if an idea is good and we're going to get value or and the grower's going to get value, then we're willing to um, at least start having some conversations or do a small project. So we're about halfway through the session. I want to open up the floor to questions. Any of the comp startup companies, the i companies in the room have a question for the panelists? And what I would say is if you have a question in the back of your mind, there's probably three, four, five other people in the audience with that same question. So please don't be shy. All right, I guess this is a shy audience. Um, so I guess another question that comes up often is risk. You know, startup companies, from your perspective, can be viewed as inherently risky in some ways and other ways not. What are some things that startup companies should think about when it comes to risk that they can take more of that off the table and make themselves more attractive to you. Yeah, it's interesting to me because now kind of seeing both sides of, of these engagements, it, it really is about the management of risk on both sides. Uh, as a startup, you're wanting to, to partner with a larger corporation to provide more, a more steady supply of, of capital and, and customers for your, for your, your, your product or, or application. Uh, as, a, as a larger corporation, the, the risk profile of, of innovation is very different, and thus, oftentimes, collaborating with startups is actually the, the least risky way to, to achieve that. And so I, I think really just putting it on the table and having that conversation about where the risks are, how they're being mitigated, and, and you, you can't always share everything on, on both sides, but you can, you, can, you can come to some common ground on where, how you want to move forward as a, as, as a collab, as collaborators on, uh, on, on the project. So I think, um, uh, from my perspective, uh, we're frequently looking to the, the, um, external partner to have taken on a lot of the risk. And so the less risky the opportunity is for us, of course, the more attractive it becomes. I mean, there are all different types of flavors of risk. There's, um, you know, there's reputation, there's stewardship, there's freedom to operate. I think one of the, around the freedom to operate um, risks, if you're coming to us and shopping an idea that you don't really have an IP position on, the value of that's going to not be so high. So that's one thing to think about as you um, develop your ideas and, and build your company. I think the other thing is we're also, you know, when you look at that scale of risk that um, we'd be willing to take on with a startup, I think the, the value that we see in the company is related to that level of risk. So if we're dealing with a really risky technology, um, you know, we're not going to pay, we wouldn't pay top dollar for that because there'd still be a lot of investment that needed to go in to, to bring that to market. 
but if you're going to be selling us something that's that's ready to go, then you know we pay for the de-risking that you did because we do understand that that's an expensive part of the business. So in CSA, uh, what we can do is actually help lower your risk because we're set there. We know we know what we're doing, so we can actually lower that risk. But the risk I, I think I want to bring up, which is is the data that you actually have. So when when um, companies work with farmers or any other anybody else, let's say you want to actually get yield data, you want to start understanding how they're doing. There's a risk at the point where you're you're a trusted third party, right? So at, at some point you're a trusted third party, and then you have to take the risk that your that farmer is giving you. He's giving you his trust. And then there's a risk of actually taking that and sharing it with John Deere, right? So, so once you have, you've got to think through that, especially in your startup situations, if you get if you're out there building trust with your um, with your end user, your end customer, and then you want to go work with a say you get absorbed with John Deere, how does that data transfer? How do you actually build that trust? Because there's risk there. You agree with that? Yeah, and, and I would say just as a startup, just help help me as as a corporate understand how you're how you're helping me de-risk that. So so help me see what you've done to make um, make my decision easier to to get approval up through my organization. Uh, the the more you've proven the value of your solution and have articulated that, the easier it is for me to go up the levels within my within my organization to get approvals for that. So going up the levels to get approval, talk a little bit about that so they can understand what your internal process is. Yeah, so it, it varies a lot based on the level of engagement. Um, you know, if, if, it's a, uh, if it's a sort of an informal, just you know, understanding a little bit more about deer and getting some feedback, that can, that can certainly happen at, at a level that's, that's very easy to facilitate. As soon as it goes, uh, beyond that, say say you come into our startup program officially or something like that, then um, it's got to go up several levels to you know probably to a vice president level to get approval for that, and so that takes time. That's one thing to understand is that it takes time to get those approvals um, with with various people around the company. One one sort of thing that I would throw out that that I see sometimes that startups do is don't. Um, don't request to, to have an audience in front of a, a level of like a senior level person at the corporate. You see that a lot where somebody asks, you know, hey, I want to talk with Sam Allen or whatever. Uh, that's it's not going to happen. Um, that those are just just understand that there's a there's a level to come in at a at a large corporation that's appropriate and and sometimes asking for something higher than that at the outset can seem a little tone deaf from coming from that startup. So from my previous experience, um, if we'd had an M&A that was under 10 million, that was a BP level. But the last one I did was Astral Point. That was 120 million plus stock. Um, that was B. That was the board. The board at some point had to get involved. So it was, you know, it was meeting after meeting yeah. after meeting. It's not easy. Um, the bureaucracies, especially with international companies, can get pretty heavy. Yeah, for a for a Blue River type of acquisition, it's it's months and months of work and, and meetings. It's it's a it's a tremendous effort to get done. And so just understand that as a startup that it is uh, there's a lot of work going on uh, at the corporate level that that you don't see that takes a lot of time. Yeah, there were a lot of people at Nutrient that I didn't get to meet till after the deal was done, but uh, but they def they knew about me and they knew about about Agrabol. So the, those conversations are happening even if even if you're not present for them. So, as you think about some of the uh, companies you've interacted with, or Tim in your case, that Agrabol interacted with prior to the the acquisition, what are some of the things that you as the corporate side of the conversation saw as risks that the startup folks didn't have a clue on. I guess I would say I would I would start with the with with the brand risk because I mean, as a as a startup, it's it, you're often just trying to get exposure and get get your name out there and and get people to know who you are. 
Whereas as a, as a large, large corporation, you have a brand, you have an established customer base, uh, and, and that trust is, is in a lot of ways your most valuable asset. And so it, it's not necessarily that we went into these conversations completely blind of that, but, but understanding how much that drives the decision making and how important that is to, how, behind, how much that is behind a lot of the questions and a lot of the, of the thought process that's going on as to whether or not a collaboration is, is likely to happen or uh, what, what shape it should take. That's been really important. Um, from my perspective, uh, not uh, understanding the risks that are involved getting a product through the regulatory um, phase and, and getting approvals to actually get to a commercial product uh, would be a key one. So following up a little bit on that, is that something that is okay for them just to acknowledge in a conversation with a corporate partner and think about that's something that you could jointly go down that path? Or Definitely. Or is that something they should try and have some of the answers ahead of time? No, I think just an uh, acknowledgement that that's one of the hurdles and then an openness to um, hearing what, what experience has taught us in that arena. I think there are also, um, in some of the newer technologies that we look at, there's also potentially a um, you know, consumer acceptance um, risk. That's something that we're always thinking about with new technology. And um, that might not be something that a smaller company would, would think about because um, you know, their name might not be associated with other controversial technologies. So one of the risks that I remember um, <laughs> is when a startup company gets bought, especially like for small dollars, um, we might have been buying them to just get them out of the market, uh, just to not have that as a problem. Uh, but we'd keep them on and we'd try to mold them into something completely different. That risk alone uh, where people get uh, over overzealous about their own product instead of thinking about, hey, my company got bought and I want to, I really want to merge into this and make something great out of it. That, that, uh, that, that's actually something as a startup you've got to think about. It's your exit strategy. How do you think about your exit strategy? What, what, what is the, how do you want to handle it personally? And that's something that uh, is really, you know, products are like babies sometimes, you know, you, you brought it from nothing and you brought it all the way up and then another you know, then you have to get adopted, and then you can't be part of it anymore. And that happens, and that's something you have to be ready for. A couple things I would say um, that, that a startup needs to be thinking about is um, the, the channel you're going to use and how to scale your product. Um, it's, it's easy to have a, a solution that works really well for a couple growers, and, and you say, you know, hey, these guys loved it, here's how it works. The, the question I have is, what's your channel? How are you going to go to a broader market? How are you going to distribute it? Those are very difficult things that, it's, that, that aren't, aren't something that a lot of times you need to think about at the beginning. Um, and then the other thing is, does your solution scale? So it, it works really well for five growers. Will it work really well for 5,000 growers? Because that's, that's the scale that, it, that it, when, it, when it comes at a corporate level that we're looking at. Yeah, and I think that actually ties back to the, the customer acceptance uh, perspective because uh, as a startup you may be targeting a very specific customer segment but the the larger corporation may be looking at a much broader uh, audience or, or customer base for that solution and making sure that you've thought about what aspects of it can still be relevant in that in that different situation is really important now some of these questions are questions where industry has a far, far better perspective on this and a lot of the, the emerging entrepreneurs sitting in the room, you're about the only place they could turn to. Are you willing to have some of those early customer conversations that provide some of that advice? Yeah, I think that there's actually a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting ground that can be covered on, on, on both sides in a conversation like that because while we've got uh, a large network of ag retailers with a with with a lot of with a, a, a large amount of crop consultants that meet with growers on a on a regular basis. 
Uh, we were sort of always trying to build that understanding of, 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 of US and, and, and some other countries, agriculture, uh, but, but the startups are also thinking about it from a completely different angle and can actually provide a really useful perspective to say, these are the emerging technologies that will solve, that, that will be the standard solution of tomorrow. So this is, and, and, and really in that, in that middle ground is where we can find uh, the, the, real, the real path forward. I think another example of that are some of the collaborations that we've done with startups um, or uh, established companies who haven't worked in ag at all before. And so um, really trying to create a situation where both sides are benefiting from working at this interface and um, have a lot of interesting discussions there, new insights, new ideas, and uh, definitely, you know, those are, I think, some of the strongest partnerships. So we've got a little less than 15 minutes left. Open it up to the floor for questions again. My name is Wayne, and I'm from Michigan State University. Uh, we are running an Amtrak program, which is a Commercialization program provide funding for university technology uh, put them on the commercialization path. So from our standpoint, our technology is very early. When you're talking about yield data, economic analysis, they don't have it. So we provide funding, but lots of time we need like a direction from industry partners, you know, what kind of data you're looking, uh, looking for. So my question here is, uh, are you willing to engage that early? Will you provide guidance to these uh, professors? If the, uh, if the answer is yes, uh, can you tell us what's the best way to approach you? If the answer is no, can you tell us why? I think that, um, you know, just the first thing that popped into my mind is if you're perhaps as part of kicking off this program, you'd want to hold workshops where you invited a cross section of potential industry partners and you know spent a day or two talking through this i think you know that might be a good opportunity to to get feedback and get some useful information uh, i think that the dilemma we have is all these technology are very unique in their field so it's very hard for our program to identify who will be that customer so for example, you're a big corporation, you have multiple like scientific fields. Are you willing to talk to us you know, and engage us with the specialists in your group and provide the guidance like for example, you need three years of field data or you need like a, how many, like a, how many a number of animals test, you know? I mean, bring us on that path instead of we just do it out of our guess to waste that money. Will you be willing to do that? So this is what we're doing for the Center for Digital Ag. Um, please mark your calendar. September 5th, we're going to have a workshop where we're going to invite industry to come in and actually listen to the ideas that we put together um, through our faculty workshops. And then as we go and seed these projects, we want to have our companies as um, basically almost mentors to some of the ideas and then be involved at the beginning. So that's, uh, we're very blessed at NCSA to have 40 companies work with us right now. Um, some of those companies are sitting right here with me right now, and it's exciting to have them, but it doesn't work unless we have an open communication and open dialogue, and you're exactly right, Kristen. You, you have to have those workshops. To come and ask them directly for data, that's tough, right, because their data is actually kind of sacred to them. So you, you, have to, you have to basically say, hey, this is an idea. Do you have a subset of data? Or this is something that we could work with? Could you anonymize some data? Is there ways that we could, you know, you have to come up with a solution that says, hey, this is, this is the best way we think we could, we could make this idea work. Are you on with us? So you, it really comes down to get to know them, spend time with them and then uh, build from there. And the uh, workshops are actually 
pretty effective because you're you're really that's a sharing time, and they're willing to do it. So Adam, so um, how do innovators in the ag tech space who want to do startups find out about failures? So if there are failed pitches, they don't turn into companies. So you don't get that information from the marketplace of ideas. So how do you kind of think ahead as to things that people tried that didn't work out rather than spending your time on a failed line of innovation? How do you find out about and discuss the failures? That's an interesting question because uh, while you're you're right that there are there are certain there are perhaps certain ideas that that don't don't get off the don't get off the drawing board essentially. Uh, I think there there have been examples of of a lot of uh, ideas and technologies in the ag industry that have gone through cycles of uh, of being something that that people are trying that perhaps are are before their time or they're missing a key ingredient. I think. I think a, a, a good example of that is a lot of the, the on the field technology was really waiting for the, the cell networks to improve and for the, the connectivity problems to be solved. Uh, and then a lot of things were, were hinging on, on big data and the, the advancements made there. And so uh, I think there are a lot of things that get, that get pushed into the, into the public sphere that you can observe and pay attention to. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of the other panelists have examples of, have, have things in mind that didn't even get off the drawing board, but I, I would say most likely if something is, is, a, is an idea that is attempting to be realized, that, they're, they're, that it does leave some, some ripples and some echoes in the marketplace. I would just add that, um, you know, a lot of the technologies that we're approached about, we've seen time and again in different flavors, different iterations, and um, you know, you need to know your background. You need to know why it failed in the past and who worked on it, why it failed, and, and then you need to be able to articulate what's changed and why, why this time it, it will actually move forward and, and be a success. And I'd give a shout out to the i program that Jed and Laura run here, all about customer discovery. Uh, a lot of opportunity to early before a faculty innovator or a grad student or a staff member puts too much effort into entrepreneurial activity. They can get real feedback on whether they're headed in the right direction or whether there are hurdles. And you know, one of the things that they find is often they, they have some technologies that the feedback is this really isn't something you ought to try to take to market and you know come back next time. But very often, they have, this is an interesting technology. You just may be thinking about the market space wrong, or you may need to redirect where you take it. So it's not necessarily as black and white as, is it good or is it bad? And, and I think that's where getting through a program that helps you understand how to reach out to folks like these and ask the right questions can be incredibly illuminating. Thanks. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Stephen Fleming. I'm co-founder of Traverse Science here. And I wanted to go back and, and ask uh, when we talked about intellectual property. So I think especially for younger companies or just starting out, how can you effectively communicate the value of your idea or technology to potential customers, partners, or investors when you haven't yet captured the, the IP aspect of it yet? Mark, you want to take that? I think just being upfront about that as you as you share that with them and say, you know, hey, this is you know the you know it's patent pending or we're working on filing that or things like that. I think that's fine um, at, at a really early stage to say, you know, this is this is what we think we'll be able to get. But at least giving a kind of a path of how you might get there would be helpful. But I don't think you have to necessarily be there already as long as you realize that. Realize the, the IP landscape around your company and how you're gonna you're gonna develop a, a niche that that protects you there. And if uh, part of the reason that you don't have it yet is a resource limitation, you know, collaborating with a larger company can be a way to get that protection then put in place jointly. 
Yeah, and I and I think when it comes to communicating the what what differentiates your solution, I think again that comes down to to shaping that message for the for the different different stakeholder groups and and finding a way and 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 figuring out the right way to say these are the results that 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 we're seeing in our tests without sort of giving away the game, so to speak. So, any last questions before I ask my last question of the panelists? Hi, I'm Tristan with ADM. So I think about the feasibility of a partnership. I think the quality of an idea is really important, but maybe also the quality of the people. You know, you can have a really good idea, but the partnership isn't going to happen because the people are too, like, difficult or something. So uh, what kind of traits do you think about that you view positively in a partner? Yeah, this is this is kind of where where I was going when I was talking about ensuring that there was a culture fit and ensuring that there was a sort of development methodology alignment. Uh, because really, if if we're not if we're not on the same page with that, then even the best of ideas will will stumble and fall. And so, uh, I guess to, to to try to get specific, uh, I mean both both as Agrable and now as as Nutrien. Uh, we we take a very agile process to to development and and we're building a digital platform. We're building software tools. So that's very very much the the the, the state of the art in in building those things. It's different when you're when you're doing different kinds of science work and 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 building hardware. But really making sure that that the team has the has the right sort of creative attitude, creative spirit, the right innovative, uh, the right focus on innovation. And uh, but but still has the practicality to say at the end of the day we want something we can release we want something we can bring out to to customers and we can refine it over time it 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 can start in one place and then get better and get better uh, iteratively but but we need to we need to be able to to create something that will become that will be fully realized. I think that was really well said. I think. Um, Making sure the, I think it, important things around communication include accessibility to um, both parties, um, openness to feedback, the ability to talk about tough decisions, challenges, uh, problems, so to have that trust in place to be able to have really deep, meaningful conversations. I think regular touch points um, very clear goals and objectives up front, and then a continual check back in to make sure those are still relevant, and if they're not, updating those and changing those can all be helpful in the, the building and maintaining that relationship. I, I would echo the specific skills you know, that they said, but I would also just emphasize that, that, that fit, that, that fit of, of talent and culture is is a huge huge part of whether a, a a partnership or an acquisition is successful or not. So it I I can't overestimate that enough how big of a deal that is. So thirty seconds each. What piece of advice would you give to the entrepreneurs in the audience? I guess I'd I'd, I'd somewhat echo what what I what I've been saying that really refine your message, refine your pitch, make sure that you are clear about what value you're offering and then what your needs are in return. Definitely say clear message and patience. Um, just because we don't, we aren't able to make a decision immediately doesn't mean no. Understand your market. Understand your market over and over and over and then understand the need. If you don't fill a need, you're, you're never going to get anywhere with these guys. So uh, that's that. That's the most, I've had so many meetings where they don't understand the market and you're like, what, you, what are we gonna sell? That's not a good, that's not a good question from your uh, guy you're pitching to. Yep, yep. <laughs> clear, a clear message that, that very, very well articulates what that need is to our growers, to our customers is, is huge. Well, please join me in thanking the, the panelists for a wonderful conversation. Thank you.